just want to kind of make a couple notes as we think about precision ag. I'm going to transfer that descriptor to digital ag, okay? And uh, digital ag really reflects, and you'll understand maybe what I'm talking about here in a minute, what's happening in the industry. And my, my real goal here today is to bring awareness to you to understand what's happening because there is a lot going on in the digital ag space or ag data space. But a few things, on ag tech hardware, um, sales are fairly um, level, if not on the upswing. Uh, I'll take Ohio as an example. We still have a lot of farmers that aren't willing to trade equipment, but they're willing to upgrade equipment. And that was over the winter months, even continuing today as we sit here in, in February, uh, spending anywhere from you know $16,000 to $40,000 to equip equipment with technology. So it's not a, a blistering sales market out there, but it's not going away either um, on that. The real effort and what I want to talk about today is kind of this digital tech. Uh, if you have been following a lot of the common um, news, farm news articles, farm press, continuing to see constant investment in digital technology. And I want to be real clear, when I say digital technology today, what I mean is that as a farmer or someone on your behalf is offering up data from the farm in order to get services or information back. And you'll see that hopefully as we, we step through this. But we're talking about billion dollars. We continue to see heavy investment in this area. But I also want to get down to, we've done several studies, surveys, and I'll talk about a couple of those today. But from a digital technology, again, the utilization of data has been pretty limited. And majority of the farmers that we've had the opportunity to engage with have found limited value in those technologies. Okay? So, why is that? May I kind of allude to that along, along our talk here today. So, I'd like to start here. A few things. Uh, if you're in the business of agriculture, if you're in the business of farming today, whether it's here in the U.S., North America, and now South America, Europe, and even down under, and you're being a, a player in this marketplace, this hits home, okay? Whether you're a farmer, whether you're a consultant, or you're in a, a startup to a long-term ag business, you have to figure out where you're gonna play in this picture right here. And I don't know of a, a company that doesn't have something like this that's represented on their webpage or presented at a, a conference like this on behalf of a company. But this is a connected farm, okay? And step, just kind of hang with me as I go through. There's three pieces to this in my mind as I, I organize this. Number one, I'm presuming, and it's pretty obvious looking around and what people are doing right now, that everyone is carrying something like this, if not an iPad or similar type device. Uh, majority of our surveys would say, regardless of age, 90 plus percent of agriculture, farmers are carrying a smartphone or similar device and doing business on it as it relates. So my point in that is the first, pe the first piece of this is already done. People are connected to the internet and doing business on their phone, okay, or smartphone in this case. The second thing in, um, in my work, being a, an engineer and stuff, is the equipment on this depiction is connected to the internet. So if you're a farmer or you're someone in this business that has traded or purchased a machine in five, depends on the company, I'll say five years since 2015, that machine is probably connected to the internet. Okay, a majority if not all machines, other than maybe Kubota, I could argue with you on Kubota, but if you're using your traditional OEM equipment, the tractors are already connected, coming out of the manufacturing plant, the harvesters are connected, okay, and that includes both combines and cotton harvesters are connected, and now in the recent years we've seen sprayers connected. So when those machines roll out of the manufacturing plant, they're connected. If you got a new truck, if you got a new truck, regardless, okay, is connected to the internet today. And everyone should understand that the companies are, connect, are collecting data on your vehicle as it sits out in the parking lot. It's connected. Whether you use it or plan to use it, that doesn't matter. But the companies are connected information on that, on that vehicle today. So the thing is, there's two things here. We got people are connected, the machine's connected, and I'll finish my day on 
what really is happening is we're trying to connect the fields. And there's a tremendous amount, like I said, billion dollar investment on what we call the IoT, but the IoT is connecting the field. We have a lot of new players, a lot of startups, but we have some traditional companies bringing IoT to the field level, trying to connect the field. And so my, my premise here is this seems like, and, I, and you can say I'm not going to participate in this, but I will tell you is just as all of us sit here and, and go through the Internet, troll the Internet and find information, you're, you're participating, okay, to using your smartphone or an app and ag, you're participating, so you're already a participant, a, a portion of what's going on. I think in three to five years as we see companies deploy in-field sensor technology, now use that as an example. If you're a farmer and have received a weather station for free and it's connected to the internet, that would be an example of a step in to a connected device at the field level. Okay? Now maybe some of you have to pay for that, but in my neck of woods there are farmers, especially large farmers, that receive that stuff for free. Okay? And then they, they deploy it either near the shop or wherever they have their connection. But we, this is very real and very quickly coming to be um, a closed system of being a connected farm out there. From that, and I'll go into a survey just right after this, this is what I see happening. And I'm going to use some survey data to kind of begin to prove this point. Again, if you're a farmer or a consultant, say I'm not participating in that, that's fine. But what I'm telling you is this is a growing and growing uh, effort within the industry where the grower or the farmer over here is going to have to start sharing data in order to get services, in some case, maybe to have access to certain products. Okay? And I don't know what goes on in Oklahoma. I haven't talked to the retail sector and know what digital technologies they're deploying or what they're having to deploy on behalf of another company because they're carrying products. But this is becoming a really active in real situation for growers, whether they recognize it, just like I mentioned on the pickup trucks or not, there's the likelihood you're going to be participating in this, whether it's yourself or someone else is going to be sharing data on your behalf. Okay? And so this is just an example. This is just some, some, again, I could put a lot of companies up here on the right, but this is a growing uh, activity of farmers having to share data external to the operation. That's what I'm talking about here. What kind of data, and this again, just my awareness, this is how we organize data, and we talk about precision ag a lot. We talk about the agronomic data, and I'll show you some examples of machine data. Again, thinking about your pickup truck, what are they collecting? Same on these machines, what's being collected and utilized. But we have machine data, a lot of prescriptions. I'm assuming there's prescriptions being here, used here in Oklahoma uh, to some level. I can tell you in the state of Ohio, 60% of our land is getting P and K prescriptions today, and I would say that would also be a reflection of Lyme application. Okay, to some, so really it's PK and Lyme, but a lot of prescriptions being built. Seeding prescriptions are growing, at least in my neck of the woods, on seeding, uh, both in corn and ironically, and I'm not here to advocate, I'm just telling you as an example, a lot of, several uh, of our retailers and precision ag providers are building uh, soybean wrecks. Okay, I would say that's somewhere between 5 to 10 percent of the farmers are using soybean wrecks today. Okay, and then we have remote sense imagery, and we'll come back to that, and then we have all this production data. Okay, again, these are all data, and I'm going to explain to you in a, uh, an exercise we went through of how much data can be collected on a farm today with these commercial products. But I want to go back to this remote sense data. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later. But for us, at least in the state of Ohio, I'm going to tell you a lot more remote sense data is becoming available to our farmers. As an example, we have um, two primary companies providing aerial imagery in the state of Ohio today. Their price point today, okay, I can buy that at $5 an acre, and some people up, upgrade that to about $10 an acre through a, a, a consultant. But somewhere between $5 to $10 a day, I get a minimum of 10 flights between April 15th and September 15th in the state of Ohio. 10 flights, and I get three different types of images per flight. So that tells me I get 30 images over the growing season for $5 an acre. I was talking to Ignacio the other day in Kansas, a similar company, similar strategy, 
10 collects to 13 collects, that means flights per year, okay, is down to $2.50 an acre. I just want to make a highlight here is what I'm telling you, if you're a farmer and have not looked into imagery, I'm not here advocating go out and buy imagery. But what I am telling you is be watching what's happening in the imagery arena. We got Planet Labs that are making some big strides on putting these microsatellites up and a lot of different companies offering imagery. It's getting so cheap. If you're not gonna buy it, companies are buying it on your half and watching what you do. That's the point, is getting very cheap to get a lot of imagery collected over. Again, we can talk about drones, aerial collection to satellite collection, but you know what Planet Labs is, their goal is to image the earth once a day, okay? Again, I don't think we're here, but I, as farmers and consultants, I would be keeping up on what's happening in the imagery department today, okay? Company told me last year, their goal was to image two million, two million acres in the U.S. today, at this coming year, two million acres, okay? Again, what are their interests? They're inter interested in advancing their products, understanding how products get applied and those kinds of things. And I can't tell you where those are, I don't know where they're gonna be flying at, but two million acres, that's, that's a pretty lofty goal to have that in-house at a company, okay? So, those are the kind of buckets. We'll talk about a few of those along the way. So how much data? And this is just a fun little exercise that we did in 2017. And I want to I want to kind of talk about Trey Colley. He's the one that kind of helped gather us. But we talk about data and agriculture all the time. And I get halfway confused. What are we talking about? Data. You know, it's like a computer. But how much data? So we did a project, and this is straightforward. We use commercial products. So when I think about my John Deere, when I think about climate and circa, those kind of products that are out there being sold or offered to you as farmers. Anyone speculate how much data, this is a 100 acre field, we collected all the data that Nate, the farm manager on the right there, was collecting with all the commercial products that he had access to. What's that? She says two terabytes. Two terabytes is a lot of data, isn't it, on 100 acres? Yeah. How about 18 gigabytes per corn plant? 18 gigabytes. How about 39 different file types of having to deal with in a total over the growing season, total folks of 60 petabytes of data with the commercial products. Again, I want to highlight, this isn't Jason or John or Brian doing some kind of research project and has some prototype sensor out there. These are the products that are at your hands, at your disposal today, okay? 60 pet, everyone knows what a petabyte is, right? Everyone be, should be shaking your head yes. We didn't. We didn't know what a petabyte was, okay? Petabyte is a thousand terabytes, a thousand terabytes. The real question at hand here for us was, number one, there's two questions that is very important to this project, I think. Number one, out of 60 petabytes, what percent of that data was accessible by Nate, the farmer, who wants access to that data during the growing season for different, different things? In particular, in this field, he's very interested in his nitrogen plan because he could do, cover that, uh, do three applications if he so chooses, and his fungicide plan, whether I'm going to add fungicide to this or not. And imagery and a couple of data sets told him he was going to add fungicide this year. What percent of the data of 60 petabytes? About 25%. 25% of that was data accessible to Nate. That is not taken out of some platform that's commercially available, having to download that data, upload it into another platform just to view it and use it. That's a tedious process. The second question we asked Nate and his advisors, he uses two consultants to help him, and they are using a lot of this data to help drive their decisions and where they go in the field as directed scouting. What percentage of that data was actually valuable to Nate? Any guesses? Huh? Jason says 5%, about 11%. 11% is 60 petabytes. That's freaking crazy. It was actually valuable. And I want to I preface my value statement. 
that is dollars or per acre that the Nate could put put his finger on to I'm confirming my nitrogen plan, my fungi plan, fungicide plan works. So it's hard to maybe put a dollar value on other than it's valuable. So you can laugh at this, but this is a lot of data and still showcases we have a long way to go to utilize the data that's being out there amongst these different technologies. So digital technologies, I've already talked about what that is. Again, submission of data to get products, information, or recommendations. I'm going to go through a couple things. We have 113 companies in North America. Just so everyone, again, this is awareness piece. 113 companies today in North America offering digital technologies to all of us sitting here. 113. So how do you choose what to use and what's valuable? We chose to put all those in the data warehousing, production analysis, benchmarking, in-season monitoring. We got crop modeling, so that would be the end models kind of things. Um, and then recommendations. You take a, a company like Climate, okay, just to, to be fair. They could go and model. They were data warehouse, crop modeling, and recommendations right up front. They, they fit into three categories, Climate, if you're using Climate, okay. And Circa would be some similar, but my point is, that's 113 companies offering digital technologies today here in the U.S. or North America out there. So this, to me, this is a real thing. These are the billion dollars being used to build these things. Now, there's one problem, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. The one problem that a lot of companies are having, they don't have the data sets to perfect or build the product that they're trying to go after. That's why, if you go back to my earlier slide, I would say there's been very limited value back to farmers or consultants helping farmers is the fact that these tools do not have the regional, if not national, data sets to build them out properly. So going back to my sharing slide, we, we interviewed or surveyed about 120 growers, very progressive growers in the Midwest. And again, this is a Midwestern survey. And we asked them several questions. I want to share this. But I want to. I want to preface, I want to kind of asterisk and preface here that these growers are very progressive. So they're probably doing vertebrate seeding, vertebrate fertilizer, and using a digital technology or, or two that I showed on a prior slide. Okay? When we ask those farmers, 92%, I want to highlight, 92% are sharing data external to the farm today. That means they're collecting data with their precision ag technology, turning around sometime probably most likely post-harvest, and sharing that data external to the farm, 92%. Now, you can say, well, that other 8% aren't doing it. Well, but a majority of that 8% are doing all their data management internal to the farm, so they're not sharing external. The interesting number is 66% of the, the folks that we, did, we surveyed are sharing with two or more people, two or more people. And 43% of those we surveyed are sharing with three or more entities or people external to the farm. So again, I'm just highlighting that back to my earlier slide where farmers are going to have to share data to get services, products, and recommendations, as an example, that that's happening today within a very progressive, and these were different sized farmers. These weren't all just 10,000 plus acre farmers. These, some of these folks were down to 12 to 1250, I think maybe been the smallest farm, 2,000, 3,500 acres, but they are sharing farm external, or they're sharing data external to the farm today. Okay. Our premise of doing this survey was trying to understand where we were going to be with a majority or a larger group of farmers in the U.S. in three to five years. That's what we were asked to figure out. Where are we going to be? And I think this starts to point to this. Interesting enough, if you're in the ag business, the two most trusted people in this data sharing is the seed salesperson and the consultant. And I will tell you, we, we had a big list, and Brian and Jason, I hate to admit, but us extension guys are pretty low on the list with these farmers. I think they would like to share data with us, but if you're, not, if you're a seed salesman or a consultant, you're a very trusted advisor and trusted with the data. Okay. So I'd just like to highlight that all the farmers, 70% of them have high or very high expectations of using the data to run their farm operation. How are they using data? Just uh, real quick, 77% of them are using variety or hybrid. 
online with almost 70% using a smartphone, again, highlighting how they're getting information, specifically here to soybean and corn selection, uh, to hybrid and variety. 96% are using data as direct input to, to management. And again, that doesn't surprise me. We've got to understand who we survey. They're using the data and using it today to improve their farming operation and directly change or influence their decisions around inputs. Uh, and 91% are using some kind of digital technology today, which again is not surprising, but they are starting to use some of these tools out there. The question I didn't ask is, are they paying for that or someone giving it to them? That'd be a really interesting question. I want to talk a little bit about this ag data space. Again, this is a, an awareness uh, piece, and then we'll talk about some of the ag technology and, and maybe have a little fun here. This is not an all-inclusive list, but the work that we do at Ohio State, or I'll say OSU, so um, is, is working with a lot of companies on this digital space, ag space. Sizes are, mean something here. I'll let you kind of de decipher what size. But these are the companies really influencing what's happening in the U.S. today. And I would describe both within the equipment industry and retail sector um, and kind of how we're evolving here in the U.S. If you haven't paid attention, you should go check out what DTN's doing. They have very strategically and actually tactically purchased some companies over the last few months to get into this digital ag space and IoT space. Be aware. Of course, my John Deere, uh, in our, my neck of the woods, it's either climate or, or John Deere collecting the majority of the data in Ohio today, period. I mean, all the planning data is going through one or both platforms, and all the yield data is probably going through one or either one of those platforms, high percentage. We know what Bayer's doing, again, with climate and understand that they're connected to some of these others. Farmer FBN, and I don't know if they're a, a vendor here, but FBN is, is doing quite a bit of work in our area. In fact, I've been very surprised over the winter months, a number of farmers in my area that have turned to them to buy crop protection products. Very cheap. They got a couple different price lists, but they're going to them, paying whatever the $500 to participate, but buying products, crop protection, and that's having a drastic, a significant impact on our retail sector in Ohio. Okay. And then, of course, Corteva slash Pioneer. Two companies I would encourage you to really watch is EFC Systems up in the middle. Okay, they are making a lot of waves and beginning, beginning to get adopted into different areas. And I don't know out here, but Indigo is making huge strides in Ohio of signing up farmers. And I project that it's probably not only through the Midwest, but across the country. Those are companies that I would be very uh, aware of and watching what they do here as it relates to digital ag. My whole point to this is, again, Winfield, you got Syngenta, Farmer's Edge is playing in this. Uh, but not as big quite yet. The functionality that's being offered through these companies, again, we talk about EFC, John Deere, uh, Corteva, okay? You can't just do precision ag today, okay? You can't just have a, an SST slash only platform. You have to have a business platform or what we call an ERP systems. So if you know what ProAgrica was, or their core business was, they're marrying SST from the Precision Ag to their ERP system. Same with EFC. And if you look at what John Deere's doing, they're, they're doing the same thing. What Corteva do here in the last 12 months? Who'd they buy? Granular. Granular. So we got their Encirca product with Granular, and everyone's starting to provide benchmarking. And I want to highlight, when we did our surveys, benchmarking is the largest growth functionality, if I want to call it, that's coming to market. And it's provided in two ways, either agronomically or business. I can look at what I'm paying or how do my cost structure look as a business compared to others. There's a lot of benchmarking coming to market here in the near future. And I got to have IoT or Internet of Things. I have to have devices, machines connected or sensors connected. Okay. Again, that's a very real thing. So that's what they're all doing. They're either purchasing or building, but they're bringing an all-in-one all type solution or attempting to to the farm front, to the farm gate. This is a little old, but I just want to kind of highlight, so you guys all know, there's a lot of connections, okay? 
This is a, a bit old. We've had some acquisitions go on, but what I will tell you is, and I like to highlight is, there's four digital ag systems, digital ecosystems in the U.S. today. And you can believe me or not, but they are, and they are all connected. They are all connected with this whole digital thing. It's, a, it's kind of this Google, this Amazon influence that's going on. And all these companies are scrambling to figure out how they're going to maintain market and how they're going to achieve that through this whole digital ag evolution that we're going through. But I just want to let everyone kind of as a mark here that we have a lot of connections in the, in the marketplace today, whether you recognize it or not. Okay? But again, if I, if I kind of redid this, we would have four primary digital ag ecosystems today in, in the U.S. here. So with that, just we're going to jump into technology, a lot of efforts in sensors, connecting those sensors to the Internet, and then the data. I will tell you, as an example, we have three projects at Ohio State that are working at putting sensors on dumb implements. And why do I mean by dumb implements? Think about tillage implements. I mean, they're just steel, right? We hook them up, maybe a little bit of hydraulics, and we go out and we perform a field operation. What I'll tell you today is we're automating the functionality on all those dumb implements today. And you saw if you had an opportunity to go to the farm, or National Farm Machinery Show in Louisville here last week over the weekend, you were seeing a couple examples of that on the, on the floor space. If you go to Agrotechnica or get an opportunity to go to Agrotechnica this fall in Germany, you will see connected machines, steel machines at Agrotechnica this fall. A lot of effort to put sensors and then control these devices, which Baffles me some days, but that's where we're heading with some of this. So, so what's happening? I, I always like to start with this. Terror till. Anyone have a terror till at their house? It's a good present. Basically, it's an autonomous weeding solution. About 300 bucks you can pay for this. It's like the Roomba, right? The vacuum cleaner. It was like the biggest thing, not this past Christmas, but the, it's the same thing. I throw it out of my... my my bed, and it's supposed to go around and, and, and weed the bed or weed the flower garden. All right? 300 bucks. But it's connected to the Internet. It operates and it collects data. It's an IoT device. Okay? And again, if you go to Agritechnica, you're going to see a lot more of these. Again, this may not be influence, influencing you guys in Oklahoma today. I would contend it's beginning to. Um, but you see a lot more weeding. I mean, with our limitation on farm labor today in a lot of areas, specifically the specialty crop areas, these devices, this is an example of a, a weed, uh, a weeder. I'm going to say 100,000, give or take 20,000 is what you can go buy those today. These are commercially available. Again, if you go to Agrotechnica, you'll price anywhere from a half dozen, a dozen of these on the floor at Agrotechnica. You could buy. You could buy them that day, have them sent here to the U.S., and you could use it. The key is, is yes, they work very slow. They're connected to the Internet. I just want to reemphasize, these, all these are connected to the Internet, collecting data, and there's a suite of sensors. Of course, you, you recognize the GPS receiver right there in the middle, or RTK device. Uh, but in this case, all the weeders, I can put a threshold in and tell it to map out where I have high infestation of weeds, okay? If I told you if this was about quarter the price, I would tell you, I'm going to assume that most of you kind of start thinking it's probably going to start to see a lot of uptake here in the U.S. Because at twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars to do this, I can replace probably six to eight people manually going out and doing some of the weeding, easily. So I just want to say that these things are, are coming to market pretty quick. Europe is the fastest pace in providing this. But I only see, especially here in our specialty crops, this coming to the, to, to the forefront. So for you guys today, this is impacting you today. Okay? Everyone recognized about a year and a half, two years ago, John Deere bought Blue River, had technology. Primarily it was for thinning of lettuce. If you didn't know how lettuce had grown, basically they overseed lettuce, and then they go out and they kill plants that bring it back to their desired population. These, there's what, two of them today running in cotton in Texas today that I know of? Okay. So about two years ago they started, this is cotton on the right, okay. Green is the cotton plants. Red is identification of weeds. 
works very slow. Okay, going, again, going back to my two to four miles an hour, these, these systems are very slow, but I think the, the big premise over the next five years for John Deere is how do I get this on a high clearance sprayer and operate it at 10 to 15 miles an hour, okay? But today, these are, some of these are running in Texas, okay? As you, if you're a cotton farmer, you understand why we're doing this, but they're here and already being adopted, okay? Again, expensive, but yet we're starting to see this expand in the weed or sense and, sense and spray technology. If you look at what's going on in Australia, there's a couple different solutions down there already being implemented, commercially available. These are coming pretty quick. And for those cotton producers, you may be thinking about using some of this in the near future. But this is here. <clears throat> Auto cart, we won't watch this, but just recognize that the auto cart came out at the Farm Progress Show last year. Um, basically, Smart Ag is probably, in my opinion, the first company to actually commercially provide an available robotic solution in agriculture today. We got the DOT, I think, out of Canada, and there's a couple others that you've seen recently in the farm press. But today, I can go to Smart Ag, which is out of Ames, Iowa, and purchase the auto cart solution that basically automates the grain cart okay with the combine and you you establish where the staging area is okay and as the combine goes the combine can call it it comes out it unloads automatically from the combine and it'll drive itself back to the staging area someone jump in unload it in the truck put it back to the staging area and then it goes and gets called back out by the combine that's here today i know we have one of those or we did have one of those working in ohio last year uh, with only probably a handful of them coming this year as they get this out to market and more available. But we're seeing smart ag and uh, the infusion of robotics into some of the machinery today. This is one example that's, that's starting to grow and getting a little bit more traction around again. I, like I said, there's others out there that are available as well. But one here. Finally, back to Tyrannus is an example. There's a couple different companies, but I just want to give you a, an example and, uh, and then tell you a little bit about our research. Tyrannus today is a, a new startup. They're having some ends here in the U.S. I know two of our precision ag service providers have signed up to use them this year. Primarily, they're going to do stand counts and then during the growing season for, I forget what they're something like 13 to 18 dollars an acre they're going to charge for this but they're going to do like four flights at least that's what they tell me here going into spring you're going to get four flights for that amount of money using this but at the same time they can they can um, the very high resolution millimeter type imagery on some of their their stuff they can get down and look at disease can you look at bugs identify specific type of insects okay um, so um Kind of to broaden that out, we have two companies, two primary seed companies, and I'll tell you who they are, Curtiva and Bex, in the state of Ohio that are deploying drones to do stand counts this year, this year free to farmers, free to their customers, giving all their agronomists the, 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 the drones to do it with the back end, a couple different companies offering very similar type thing. And you can believe me or not, but, I mean, if I can get stand counts and get 30-plus points in a field, that, that's pretty informative to me, especially if we think about replant decisions uh, and marrying that up with some of our yield mapping. It's very influential on what's, what happens and can be very telling. This is one example, again, I just want to emphasize, uh, at Ohio State, what I can tell you is we're doing below, can below canopy sensing, and we're above 90% confidence on disease detection in corn and soybeans. Uh, and nutrient deficiency detection in soybean, uh, corn and soybeans. And so I'm not saying it's here today for everyone, but in the near future, these, these options, and I think they'll be very cost effective for you to have access to, you're going to see either drones or high resolution imagery coming to your doorstep to use for stand counts, insect management, nutrient deficiency management, those type of things. It's coming very rapidly. And multiple companies are trying to perfect or commercialize some of this, Tyrannus being one example here. So, again, coming very quick. So, what are we doing in ag technology? This is one of our research machines. Um, 
I'm not here to advocate what it can do, but what I am telling you is what is possible with the technology today. Both the planner today, everyone should be shaking your head, is connected to the internet. I can sit in my office on an iPad app and watch the planning and collect a tremendous amount of information from that. Uh, and the tractor, okay? Brian, you want to go ahead and play that? Again, I'm out here advocating that high-speed planning is for everyone, okay? But it's here, and it works. Of course, we have two companies primarily offering the technology. I'll offer up. Anyone know how fast we were planting in that video? What's that? 14? 17 and a half miles an hour. 17 and a half miles an hour. If you've never had an opportunity to ride in a high-speed planner, even at 8, 9, 10 miles an hour, I encourage everyone in the room to go take a ride sometime. It is a totally kind of different experience around planning. Okay? So, again, I'm not advocating, but what I will tell you, and we, we've been putting uh, some reports out for the last two years, is it works. Okay, now this is a conventionally tilled field. You see some rocks there. You see a rock there on the left side. So you understand what the, the, the road cleaners are doing today. They're not, you know, getting brush out. They're kicking rocks out. But 17 and a half miles an hour, what I would tell you is you may give up a little bit on spacing quality. But from a yield perspective, there is no yield difference at the end of the year. We're still getting it planted. Those row units aren't vibrating as much as you think they are because of the active downforce technology that we're using today and is yielding the same as if I was planting a five year, five miles an hour. Again, I'm not here to advocate. Anyone know why we didn't plant faster than 17 and a half miles an hour? What's that? The auto steer, kicked out. The auto steer kicks out about 18.3, 18.4 on, a, or on a, a case tractor. And I guarantee you there's not a person in this room that can drive that tractor and that planter straight <laughs> in a field at 12, 15, or 17 and a half miles an hour. So, anyways, I'm out here advocating, but it works. Um, and I think, in general, what I'm just saying is we can map the seeds. We're getting the quality as we expect. And I can watch all that operation on, on the apps out there. Weight is weight, and so something's got to carry the weight on that machine. And if Dr. Taylor was here, he could probably explain some things. But in general, number one, did anyone notice how big the tractor or the quad tractor was? That's a 40-foot planter, by the way. That was a 16-row planter, 30-inch rows. Anyone see how big the tractor was pulling that? Probably can't see the MX number on the front of that. That's a 500-horse tractor pulling a 40-foot planter. Who in your lifetime would have thought we need a 500 horse tractor on a 40 foot planter? If you think about planning, we used to just use whatever was available and we pulled the planter regardless of size to some degree. But what changes is compaction is compaction, but the power to do it is a whole new thing. Why are we using 500 horse? Because in 17 we had a 400 horse equivalent setup, as you saw, and we shut her down a couple of times, especially if you get on inclines. Uh, and we weren't going to 17 and a half miles an hour when it shut down. It was more like 10 miles an hour. But the point is, you got to have horsepower, not only to propel or move the machine, but hydraulically and electronically to, to operate. It's a whole new world when we get to something like that. So. Are you covering enough acres to pay for all that? So Jason says, are you covering enough acres to pay for all that? That's a good question. I think the, the decision that our folks are going through is we have a lot of 60-foot planters going through Ohio for corn and soybeans. The question is, can I get myself back down to like a 24-row or even a 16, or excuse me, a 16-row 40-foot planter and do the same amount? And you can go in high speed. Some guys have been able to, to prove that I can get smaller, go faster. Um, but I, don't, I, I want to be high. It's a different world when you start doing that kind of speed. Logistics, power, there's other things that you have to change to make it work. So this is the kind of data, if you're in farming and you know this uh, just right out of climate, this is an applied downforce. It's not noted up there, but you see the applied downforce on each of the row units. 
I also want to highlight that that planner I showed you is not a 16 row planner anymore. It's 16 one row planners. We're operating that planner individually. Each row is operated independently in what we're doing. Okay. So I get this map. It's a applied downforce. It's called the agronomic data I showed it earlier. Uh, my only point to this is that shows you where the compaction is. Now, the map indirectly shows that we had to go out there with a hand penetrometer and show wherever those red areas were, which happened to be the wet areas during the prior harvest that we actually had compaction issues, which when we put the nitrogen study in, Brian, put a nitrogen study in here, is if I didn't know that compaction, I got emergence issues in those, is those areas, but it was compaction, not the nitrogen. So we have co-founding variables here in our projects that at least that we found out about. But these data sets or these as planted data is starting to kind of lead us to understand what's happening out there in the field indirectly in some ways. On that machine too, this is the machine data. I want to highlight what are we pulling off of these machines. Um, most of the OEMs have their own system that you can use to pull this data, or you got Farmer's Ed, Climate, and a couple others that offer basically a puck that I plug into the diagnostic port. Here's a 10.4 miles an hour. Again, this is a planning. Okay, Andrew's out there, but you can see the oil pressure, you see the engine load on, on that particular tractor, and I could scroll over, and there's probably 30 plus variables that we're collecting out there in the field today. Okay? Just be aware that this is hard to get your hands on today, for the most part, this machine data, but the companies are collecting it on your behalf. We're doing two things is identification and compaction back from the harvesting operation. And I can also show you some fuel management and variable costs that we're taking that and repackaging it and basically doing two scientific but distributions on some of these, these variables. And you can say, when is that turning and how much does that cost versus when I'm actually uh, engaged in doing a field operation. We got some analytics that hopefully we'll start seeing some companies provide back. The real marriage that we've been working at is how does this all marry up the yield and the, the production in the field. So to also be highlighted is there's several companies trying to collect this data. Okay. I, and, and I'm not an expert, but I'll take granular and, and, and such, but they're able to pump this data directly in to their software to give you true variable costs for that field based on this data. So understand it's starting to be consumed and used. That's machine data. I always like to allude, basically we got these Fitbits for ag running around that's basically being passed out. I don't know what they're costing you out here, but we got retailers that are getting some of these, these quote Fitbits for free to use on their, their machines. But that's, you know, what that is is essentially the same thing as a Fitbit if you're wearing that today. So a couple things, I just want to highlight, so they kind of asked me to talk about it, and I'm out here, I'm just again here to bring some awareness. Artificial intelligence is a real thing today in agriculture. If you're sitting here and you're, if you've been on the internet, you've lived through artificial intelligence, period. It's being used very broadly and it's being used in agriculture. I'm just going to give you some examples of it. Where's artificial intelligence and machine learning? One thing, understand that artificial intelligence, very, very simply put, is the emulation of the human behavior is, is in mathematical terms. Very simple, that's Dr. Fulton's term, is emulating human behaviors. Machine learning, you hear a lot or you read a lot about machine learning. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, first of all. Machine learning is a specific type of artificial intelligence. For agriculture, majority of the companies are implementing the machine learning techniques. Why? The, the thing that's unique about machine learning is it's an evolving analytical process. It can learn on its own once it's trained. So as more data comes in, it kind of retrains itself so it can evolve. That's what our machine learning is. So a lot of companies are using machine learning or trying to implement machine learning techniques. Where are we using it? Yield prediction, okay? Companies are doing yield predictions based on weather and historical yield on a field. You can go out there and actually see that today. Plant breeders are using artificial intelligence very heavily. In fact, I read an article this week where it was a bear that released some information on their, their efforts on the breeding program where they've taken off one year of coming to market now because of the implementation of artificial intelligence, okay? 
Autonomy, I showed you that, that smart ag and, and everyone else, it's evolving, it's learning in the field. Okay, so it's using artificial intelligence as an example. Automated machinery adjustments, I'll talk about that in a minute and it's shortly, but we're going to see more machines. Again, Agrotechnical will highlight some of this, are using our artificial intelligence. Okay, soil properties. Brian, I know this is kind of a, a far off and I question where we're heading with this, but I think at some point we're going to do a better job. But a lot of people are trying to model, I'll put that, soil properties at some level. Commodity marking, that's a very interesting one. Anyone interested in marketing today? A lot of effort to, to kind of mix the yield prediction into commodity marketing. I would pay attention to what's going on. And then field conditions. Uh, what I would tell you is you can go out and find intellectual property in each one of these categories out there today. You can go to the patent office and look at who all is getting IP around some of these digital tools out there. Here's some work that we did. All I want to tell you is the, the yield map on the right was predicted about the second week of July. On the left there's the actual yield map that came off the machine. I predicted the yield. Again, I'd be the first to tell you there's a lot that can go on between July and September, October when we throw the combine in to harvest this corn crop. But I'm telling you is we're getting pretty dang good at predicting yield, okay, at a very specific time frame. Okay, and in Ohio, depending on planting date, that could be the last week of June up to about the second week of July. Doing pretty good. What I would tell you is we're using it to plan soil sampling sites. We're using it as early detection to begin our fertility planning, our pea removal in particular, and then evaluating marketing plants. Okay, so I'm sitting there in July and I'm looking at my marketing plan. I'm having more confidence in how it potentially could turn out, though weather and other things could influence things. I'm just telling you, I got confidence where I'm at, much deeper or much higher confidence in July. So this is one example. This is something we've been uh, publishing, but this is a, the implementation of machine learning techniques on a field-by-field -field basis to predict yield using soil characteristics, past yield, and elevation slash drainage, in, in our case, very deep uh, within the field. So where we see it today, if you see the 2019 New Holland Combine, artificial intelligence is built into that combine. You can go to Klaus slash Challenger and they're bringing the same thing to market. That combine will adjust itself on a go and learn the terrain attributes of the field that it's operating in. Okay? But artificial intelligence slash machine learning is being used. If you haven't seen, we got planter setting adjustments on the go, specifically downforce where we're going to see some automation there or is basically coming to market automation. Prescription maps, variable, variable rate tillage or variable tillage, okay? Again, you look at deer and case, basically they got sensors on their, their tillage tools. And I won't tell you that we could, unless you want to know, but how they're doing it. Basically you can put in, in your screen, what percent residue you want to leave on top, okay? And clots, for example how big you want to let your clods, and it will adjust itself on the go to maintain whatever those thresholds you're putting in. Either residue management, clod management, and these tools can begin to do it. Okay, it's, it's pretty interesting. Fertility tools, and then field accessibility tools. These are all, if you're getting prescriptions from some of the companies, the likelihood they've implemented some kind of machine learning on, on that prescription today, if you're getting it from some of these companies. So with that, I want to talk about two devices and we'll wrap up. Uh, you've probably seen this from Precision Planning. There's a couple other companies coming to market with some similar things. This is the Smart Firmer. On the left there is an example of the organic matter map. On the right is yield. All I'm saying is, even as scientists, we're, we're kind of struggling with what, I, what is it really telling us? But the fact is, we're going to have quite a few farmers in Ohio running Smart Firmers and giving us a whole new insight. Again. What are we actually measuring and to what level quantification we could we can debate that but the point is I think this is going to change how we run the planning operation in the near future. If you're in a seed business I would encourage you to be watching what's happening with these smart firmers. I think this is going to influence seed sales and a placement of seed and fields in, in the near future here but this is these are things that are coming again this is just an example for precision planning. 
I don't know, I assume that uh, some folks have them out here. I don't know. We don't have any information. What I can tell you is we've gone up to probably seven miles an hour on our multi-hybrid planters. And I'll show you a picture here at the end. You can look at, in fact, um, if the settings are right, they will change very, very rapidly. How they work at 10 miles an hour, I, I, I don't know if I know that quite yet, but they're pretty impressive. Um, so the other thing, again, this is Terralytics. If you guys have not seen this, uh, Brian and I were talking about this before we, uh, this morning here, but several companies come to market with these sensors that do things other than soil moisture and soil temperature. They're talking about trying to measure nitrate and potentially some phosphorus, and I'm, I'm still baffled, but the point is, as we get more of these out and tested, I still think there's going to be a lot more of these devices deployed in the U.S. very quickly, okay? And you're seeing a couple different companies. If you haven't paid attention, there's one company in the U.S. that is providing this type of sensor for free to some farmers, free of charge. I get to go out and put them in my, my field. So with that, hopefully I didn't bore you all. I'm just telling you, that's kind of our view of what's happening in the digital ag space. If you take home a lot of data that can be collected today, I'm out here advocating. The question is, how do I harness it and use it for, as a value proposition back to the farm operation? Uh, accessibility is a big issue, but I will tell you is when we look across the Midwest, there's a lot of farmers using digital technologies. If you're kind of interested in looking and seeing what, what some of the results, Brian, right there to your point, that Ohio, that's a 30-inch uh, soybean field using multi-hybrid planter, probably planted about five and a half miles an hour, but you see the crispness of the change there at five and a half miles an hour. My point is the, the multi-hybrid stuff works pretty, pretty impressive, but that's just two different, uh, I think a two versus a three put in that field to give the contrast. Uh, but anyways... A lot of our technology, if you want to look at some of our research, I think we had 96 studies that we put in from Ohio State. There's a, a big crew behind the scenes that, that reports this. But 96 studies, it's an online edition. I do have a couple hard copies that I can give Brian and Jason and folks, but uh, give you, but this is something new that we're doing at Ohio State to, to get our information out from a technology and even agronomy space, trying to, trying to, so. With that, <laughs> I'll leave everyone to, if there's any Q&A, any pushback, or, or any discussion at this point. So if it worked, it's pretty cheap, very cheap, to store 60 petabytes of data. If you're using S3 type from Amazon, very cheap if you look at the pricing structure. The problem we had is we couldn't get all the data into a cloud storage platform. We brought a couple of box and some Amazon services to their needs. We could not get the data up. And so how much does it cost? It cost me over, I think Trey bought over five external hard drives to make the project work today. So that gives you, we're not quite, the issue is we're not quite at a point where that data can be moved very easily from whatever the server, however someone's given it to us to even a cloud to store. So how much? I'm going to say it's less than a hundred bucks. If you, if we could truly get it into a cloud storage that's traditional out there, it is very cheap to store it today. So I would tell you in general, a majority of the, the ag community is very conscientious in making sure that data is safe and secure and not accessible to anyone outside of the ag industry. The number one uh, concern that we always get is, you know, can the government have access or some kind of environmental type group that could use back, kind of back onto us or you. Um, I think that's, that's being, you know, being handled directly. Now on the marketing side, I think you need to take a bigger look. On the marketing side, uh, I don't think we've quite built, the tools aren't quite here, but my comments back to imagery being readily available and ability to predict yield and some of this getting to high resolution, I think you need to be paying attention to who 
you're doing business with. Um, and that's tough, but it doesn't take a lot of fields to start to predict, in my opinion. I mean, if we got 10% in a county, we're probably doing pretty dang good. We can do a lot of project projections. I've seen, and again, I'm not here saying it's out there being used. I've seen some projections during planning that some of this technology is being used on. It's amazing. Just planted acres up to a certain date well exceeds what USDA, and I would tell you, is in much more accurate than the, the USDA projections. The question is, is how is that going to get managed and is the government going to inject themselves to make sure that something, someone doesn't get a hold of it and begin to, right? I mean, you think about the stock market. The fact, if I can just have information a second or two faster, I can make a lot of money. It's the same thing. We're starting to, I think those discussions are very important, but right now I don't see people quite going to the level of marketing yet, but they could have the capacity given enough information and distributed appropriately. And that's something, that, my point is, it's on you, all of you, to figure out who you're going to do business with and who has access to that data. I'd be very conscientious. So let me tell you, going back to my connected farm, there's two issues right today. I want to make it be very clear. The two issues is, is broadband wireless connectivity across the whole rural America. That's an issue today. I don't know about you in Oklahoma, but you would think in Ohio, just having 4G access is pretty limited in some areas, if not available at all. So that's a big problem to your, to your question. The secondly, the, that gets to my answer my question, understand the other prohibiting thing to getting a connected farm to work for the farmer is a term we call interoperability. Interoperability is the ability of data or information to be exchanged between platforms. I'm assuming majority of you sitting in here, if you're a farmer or consultant, don't work with just one brand of equipment as a prime example. But the ability of, to share across platforms, the interoperability of data is an issue today and, uh, and, mar and for marketing purposes, to, to be quiet. So how are we getting data from the field? Majority of that was moved on 4G cellular modems, either in the machines uh, or the, the sensors or in the case of imagery, uh, those were typically the imagery is going to be, going back to the comment, is going to be arrived in some kind of platform that's using cloud technology. So uh, the weather data and some of that is, again, all through an app that gets downloaded or can be downloaded. Uh, but the data coming from the machines and sensors in, in the field that Nate is using is primarily 4G cellular connectivity. My John Deere, climate, those, those type of things, cellular. All right, <clears throat> so there's satellite delivered imagery, to your point, and I don't know the company that you mentioned, but there's, uh, if you're using climate or in circa products, they're using satellite imagery. There's aerial derived imagery, which is some of the stuff I showed here today. Uh, that multiple companies are providing, and then there's drone or um, derived imagery. Uh, some of the companies that are doing stand counts are flying about 50 feet above the crop to count individual plants. So his question is directly to um, satellite imagery, and I'll probably get some tomatoes flying. I'm not excited about satellite imagery today, and the reason is for us, in trying to do field level decisions management in season, probably the best resolution that you're going to get, the best, is five meters from most of those companies. I don't know the company that you're talking about. But five meters gives me kind of a coarse look. Again, looking at those and kind of knowing this, this generally is good and healthy. This is potentially stressed. But it doesn't give me the resolution um, and I could show you pictures of the same field done multiple different ways. It gives me a snapshot, but I think what satellite imagery does is drive you more to the drones or directed scouting more to where you need to go and do some real ground truthing. When you get to the aerial and the drones, you're going to get a lot higher resolution, if not down to centimeter type stuff that satellite will not do. That's my opinion. Let me play devil's advocate on that, John. So. 
you're saying five year resolution isn't enough, and, and I would, depending on what you say, I agree, disagree. But if our applicators are 120 foot wide, making a change every second to three seconds, do we need five year resolution if that's the, the resolution we're applying at? So I would tell you, my opinion is yes. And, and I get to the point we can only manage down to typically the size of the machine, the width of the machine. But even if we look at sprayers and applicators today, we're starting to break them down to sections, if not half sections. Uh, the other thing that I would tell you on satellite imagery, from our experience using these and trying to influence in season is, and I'll probably get again, is the time of delivery. When is the picture taken to when, it's, when I have it accessible? A lot of satellite imagery is five to seven plus days after the fact. Typically on aerial imagery, I can get that within 36, if not 24 hours. And if I want to do something, I want to look at my field and actually employ a field spray event, nitrogen application event, whatever it, I better get myself down to 24 because you're just getting a snapshot. Because in seven days, there's a lot that's changed in seven days in satellite imagery. The turnaround satellite imagery in my, our experience has been very slow, five, seven plus days. So. Anyways, I want to thank everyone for, for at least letting me up here preach, maybe we can call that, but uh, I'll be around for the next few days, but thanks a lot.